Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to Vorpal Board. It is your Tuesday night Vorpal Board stream, and I have a very exciting and special guest with me. I have Fertessa Elise, who is the designer of Book of Villainy, which is currently live on Kickstarter. And we're going to be talking about her game, Book of Villainy, tonight. Fertessa, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. And oh, hello, yeah. everybody. Yeah, no, no <laughs> problem whatsoever. So um, some quick, the, the, the big details of the game. It launched on June 7th. You have about a mm -hmm. week left, eight, seven or eight days, something, something in that mm -hmm. range. I, I never know when they switch that date. You're already at 120% yeah. of the target, so congratulations on funding. Very exciting. Thank you. Um, you have almost 300 backers at this point, um, mm -hmm. and you're going for stretch goals. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that the cur current two stretch goals that are going for are social stretch goals, which I think are a cool, cool concept. Mm -hmm. So um, if after you watch this stream, if you're interested in checking out Book of Villainy, um, I'm going to drop a link into the chat right now um, that will take you to uh, the Kickstarter. You can go check it out. You can contribute to those stretch goals on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then there's lots of video content of the game, and then you'll be able to get a good summary of the game tonight. Um, it's being published by Gold Seal Games. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so that's the hot facts. Um, for Tessa, let's jump right into discussion of the game. So yeah. let, let's, let's hear... The pitch. Let's hear the 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 the. I, I know you probably have honed this over many <laughs> many conversations and many playtesting sessions. But mm -hmm. um, but we have a bunch of assets that I'm going to be able to show on screen. Um, yeah. and so if you want to take us through kind of the basics of the game and kind of how it works mechanically, that'd probably be a mm -hmm. good a good place for us to jump off. Yeah. Sure. So, Book of Villainy, you are a villain, but you're not very good at it. So you are writing a book about being a villain instead. Um, you are going to be going around this kind of rondelle um, of different locations in this city. And each space in the rondelle lets you choose either a nefarious action or a respectable action. Um, so they're both going to be actions that help you with building your book. Um, if you look in the center, um, there are kind of three pages face up. And those pages are how you get villainy points, which help you win the game. Um, and how you arrange those pages and the types of pages that you collect are going to be how you win. But those different spaces in the city that you land on, um, if you choose a nefarious action, it's going to let you kind of get ahead a little bit quicker. They're more powerful um, than like the respectable actions, but they also make you vulnerable to the hero who goes flying around. Um, as you can see him there. And the hero is actually motivated by your fellow villains um, because basically you spend the game snitching on each other and telling the hero to go bother that guy. Um, you have henchmen in the game. Those henchmen help you uh, build your pages. They also help you get the hero off your back um, and break the rules. So um, it's pretty simple. Move up to one to two spaces, do an action, and then moves to the next person so fast game cool yeah person with the best book of he wins and i think i think i there was a description it's funny because in the kickstarter the language says like for all the board game nerds here's mm -hmm. the type of game it is right because you yes. use the word rondelle right which which mm -hmm. is like that's a board game nerd term like until i was into board games i would have just been like what are you talking about right mm -hmm. um but the 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 official board game nerd description is a rondelle-based set collection and tableau building game, which I think is which is cool, right? Because there's a lot of stuff going on in this game. Mm -hmm. um, you're building your book, so you're getting your chapters, and then yeah. you, you need to make sure that you get those chapters in a nice order. So yeah. there, there are numbers on the chapter cards, which is cool. So you got to use actions to sort of get your tableau in order. But then there's also benefits of getting sets inside that chapter. So different combinations of you can see these little images in the top left corner of every single chapter um, are the mm -hmm. types of chapters that they are. So it's so it's clever. Like I think that while you're playing, you have a lot to think about in this game, and it it on its surface seems oh yes, it's quick and simple, but I think there's there's likely a lot of depth to it, which I think is always the mm -hmm. the trickiest part from a design perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I found interesting when I was looking at this Kickstarter um, is. You work with a lot of artists on this mm -hmm. one, and um, a lot of this game's development and kind of the work on the Kickstarter, I assume, was done during the pandemic, which means that a lot of mm -hmm. it was done remotely. 
Um, yeah. How did that work? How did it work working with a bunch of artists and trying to keep the art style headed in sort of a cohesive direction? Yeah. Um, so Andrew mostly handled, uh, Andrew's the uh, publisher and owner of Gold Seal Games, but he mostly handled all of the interactions with the artist. And once it was ready and everything had been developed gameplay wise, um, that's when he reached out and found kind of the main artist, uh, Melissa Douglas, who did the character art as well as the backgrounds. Um, and then he also um, found um, Katie and um, our other graphic designer and had them work on um, the other aspects once the, uh, the the character designs of the backgrounds were already created. So um, kind of pipelined it. Um, but the timeline exactly, I'm I'm not sure of the details uh, since he handled that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. I think I think that it came together really well in being this sort of fun comic book style villain feel to the art, right? Which I think is mm -hmm. which is which is really neat. Um, yeah. And and I think that throughout all the components that I've seen, uh, you have kind of a real co cohesive feel to the game, which then mm -hmm. combines to kind of a humorous concept right like the writing yeah. of the game one thing that that as viewers you might not be able to tell is the writing of the game is is humorous right so the chapter cards all kind of say funny things that you could put in your book um yeah. and so there's there's definitely some some moments where you're putting together a silly story essentially about being a villain which i think is um which fits really well with the art style so i think that was a really good job um mm -hmm. all right so so the next thing I'm, that i was very excited about to talk to you specifically is that yeah this game i've been following you on twitter for quite some time um mm -hmm. and this game went through a whole host of changes in design you know changes in design direction mechanics mm -hmm. changes um and, and and most if not all of that has been documented by you yeah. in a public uh, board game geek thread, a work in progress mm -hmm. board game geek thread, um, which is kind of a fascinating thing to look at. I, I look, it's like nine pages long of comments. Yeah. Um, and, and what I was really excited about was you posted a lot of like art shots and it's yeah. like, okay, this is how I started. And now I changed direction. Uh, were, were you using that primarily as like um, uh, a, a way to sort of hold yourself accountable or what, what was your mm -hmm. goal with that, with that thread? What did you want to get out of it? Yeah. Um, so when I started, it was just the start of my entire like design and and um, gaming journey. So really, this was like my way to scrapbook that journey and also to hold myself accountable. Also, I have a terrible memory, so it's very important for me to have kind of a journal um, with my thoughts because um things will happen where maybe I get stuck in a rut or a creative block and like it, maybe I just had really bad play test, um, which happened a lot. And I had to, you know, write down what that person said or what those people said, but I wasn't necessarily immediately motivated to iterate or, you know, I couldn't figure out immediately how to correct the problem that I was finding. So having it written out and then, you know, being able to return to it and, you know, seeing it written out in a cohesive way would help me get back in the mindset and start thinking about it. But if I hadn't, then I would have been, I would have wasted more time trying to kind of tackle the problem just by trying to remember what exactly the problem was. Yeah, I, I have to commend you, right? Because as, as, as a creative person, just sort of like putting that out there publicly for somebody to look at, like, yeah, man, that terrifies me personally. Um, <laughs> you know, just because... I don't know. People can be mean, right? Like mm -hmm. you're sort of saying, all right, well, uh, this is my first design. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm putting it out there, you know, come and shoot holes in it if you want. But what was cool yeah. was that there are all sorts of really helpful and interested comments on there, you know, like yeah. I, I, is that, had you seen that on board game geek and known that that was kind of a thing that people were doing, or was this just <laughs> sort of something that you, you came up with off the top of your head? Um, I knew that they had a work in progress area. And so, I wasn't sure like when you were qualified enough to make one, but I was just like, well, if I could make one, why not? Um, I'm the kind of person that when I have the idea to do something and I think that it's a relatively good idea, I'll just do it and see what happens. Um, so that was why I was curious about it and I decided to see what happened. Um, and like, as far as my interactions on board game geek, <laughs> I've had, I've had, 
you know, the really positive ones that I got um, like on my, my work in progress thread. And then I would make other threads asking like very specific questions and those ones could just cut right to the bone, but yeah. still you could, there were very helpful um, answers. Like even if they weren't nice answers, um, and then I would just take it back to my thread and, and try something different. Like uh, one time I made a whole new board. I spent the entire day redoing this board. And then I posted a thread. I was just like, does this make sense? Does the UI make sense? You know, and it just got killed. And <laughs> I never even printed that board. I never even played on that board. I just went straight to the next iteration <laughs> well you know what like that's that's the fail fast mentality right is it's just g give it a try you know and if, mm -hmm. if, it, if it if it totally dies on the vine then move on to something mm -hmm. else i think i mean that that, that that's very cool right because like i mm -hmm. think um i guess maybe this is me just imagining what a game designer is like but like i always mm -hmm. think like well they're, they're very much kind of in their own head thinking through stuff mm -hmm. right in a dark room with a lamp over them you know <laughs> <laughs> scribbling notes and then looking up now like but 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 essentially that that ability i think it's very neat that, that you can use an online community to mm -hmm. to quickly iterate like that and and i'm yeah, also yeah. i think it's it's interesting because i you've, you've mentioned this before i was listening to an interview with you um earlier mm -hmm. where you it, your design journey mirrored your journey in like learning just just learning mm -hmm. what games were out there which is cool yeah and you gave the example that like your initial board was like yeah. Monopoly style, right? Cause yeah. like that was the type of game you played like moving around yeah. the board, which like all of us mm -hmm. played. That was like the first games we played. And then mm -hmm. you played some Catan and then like your next yeah. board was more like hex, hex based. And then, then you're yep. like, oh, but rond rondelles are a thing. So now I can like make yep. that. Like, I think that's really neat. I think it's a cool, um, if nothing else, it's like a cool artifact that now you have out there mm -hmm. of that experience, which is which is really I think unique. So that's very it was really, yeah. really neat to look through. So I actually dropped a link in the chat if people want to like go read awesome. that, go go read it. It's very neat, um, and I think it's a it would be a cool tool for any you know first time designer to look at to just sort of yeah. just watch that experience from afar. Um, so you mentioned in uh, when you were talking about the thread about play mm -hmm. tests now it, yeah. it seems like you were doing a lot of in-person play tests early on um mm -hmm. how did that go did you enjoy that did you hate that it seemed <laughs> like maybe maybe it wasn't always the most comfortable like like take me through that experience a little bit yeah i have a love-hate relationship with play tests i i love actually the play testing i hate flagging down play testers um because i'm an introvert and because i was kind of um, jumping into the hobby without knowing anyone within the community. If my friends didn't go to the gaming conventions, then I was absolutely alone. And even when they came, I was sitting playtesting and they were going about, you know, playing other games. So um, for me, the, the playtesting journey was like trying to get over feeling like a salesman you know, because people have their eye on different things and you're just like, hey, would you uh, you have some time to play a, a play test a game, you know, or if anybody was standing like looking idle and you've been sitting there for an hour and it's just like, do I do I bug them or do they? So I would spend hours like I could sit there eight hours and get four play tests. And it's just uh, it, it, that could be very painful. Um, but when I was actually play testing and, you know, actually able to see how people are reacting to the game, talk to them, write down my notes, that, that development process, I really enjoyed. Um, so, uh, you know, being able to play test online where people kind of signed up to do the play testing, that was great. Cause I was just like, just cut, cut that right on out. But, um, yeah, that's my, journey yeah those those play testing kind of rows or non-pump events or, or uh, unpub events and stuff at conventions like i love going to those rooms because like mm -hmm. there's so much just crazy different stuff in there and you never know what level of like doneness it is mm -hmm. but uh, but i've always sensed that kind of low bubbling energy of like like please like i want to grab you and pull you down to my table and so you can play my game but i but i don't want to mm -hmm. I don't want to be weird, right? So, yeah. so it de it definitely has that feel where, especially as a person walking through, yeah, like everyone's looking at you like, please, come, right, please come and sit at my table. <laughs> it's like I should keep moving. Um, You're right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but but and, but I I really recommend anybody who goes to game conventions like 
get in there and try some stuff. Like one, I think like you're going to make some designers days, right? Just getting more people yeah. into those events. But also like I've played some games there. I've never seen them again, but they've been weird and interesting. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's a cool part of the hobby that, that yeah. people should experience, not just wander around to kind of the big name booths. I think going to those little, uh, those little mm -hmm. designer rows is fun. And something else I will say, because I think a huge thing that was also contributing is um, in the beginning, a lot of the conventions that I was going to weren't just only gaming conventions. Um, I went to a lot of anime conventions in my state um, and they would have gaming rooms or designated areas for gaming. Um, and both the kind of gaming area that's designated will be entirely different as well as kind of the attitude towards gaming. Um, so having a system set up that helps for play testing versus having people that have even had experience play testing and, and people that are just looking for like published games is totally different. Um, Cause I'm probably one of the worst experiences I had. I was uh, placed like the gaming section was right next to the video game section and the lights were dark and it was like these strobe lights going on and it is loud music. And I was just sitting there underneath a giant banner for like a, a uh, um, one of those mega companies, um, one of their like TCGs or something. Yeah. And it was just like, I just had one little sheet that was like, would you like to play Test Book of Villainy? <laughs> <laughs> So convention matters. Yeah, that 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 would be tough, right? Because like I I um on the East Coast over here, I used to go to uh, PAX East mm -hmm. a lot, which is which is primarily a video game convention, but they have a tabletop area. And then, but the difference of that to like PAX Unplugged, which is dedicated tabletop stuff, even that is massive, right? Like just it, mm -hmm. it's like a totally different world. The convention is like a lot quieter. You don't have like mm -hmm. blasting music and people screaming everywhere. Um, yeah. but, um, but yeah, like if, if you're just kind of trying to go to not even gaming conventions specifically, I can imagine that would be a tough crowd potentially. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's cool because it's the geek crowd yeah. and like people that were in anime were just like, Oh, look at these villains. And they, you know, and I had drawn, I had hand drawn them. So they looked kind of anime style. <laughs> so that was working in my favor, but at the same time, the the venue was a little bit. It's definitely different from like organized gaming, like Unpub yeah. or Protospiel. Yeah, um, yeah, and they do a great job. I mean, that was mm -hmm. like a, the the well, I've, I've never done, I've never been to a Protospiel event, but I've I've been to an Unpub event, and that was mm -hmm. was just very enjoyable as sort of a random person rolling in. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's uh, that's cool. Uh, the char the charismatic punk says hi hi hello hello the charismatic hello. punk and warp drive dude thanks for hosting this I was interested in backing this game and want to hear more so you are in oh, the sweet. right place warp drive dude um, so no, that's very interesting I you know like I think you you've like you've really built your armor right like during during yeah. this design process that's uh, mm -hmm. that that's very cool like I mean I'm sure it was not the most comfortable ride all the time right but but, <laughs> yeah. but you you've earned it uh, via via the 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 back room convention tables that's that's why yes um, and you mentioned before about um, putting my stuff out for other people to judge but I will say I started my armor with that early because I went to school for digital media, which is fine arts. So we had to get torn into for about four years for everything and learn how to take critiques and give critiques. So I was, I was training for play testing before <laughs> I actually had to. That, that is, that, that's very true though. Cause you know, like I, I think there's, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of paths you can take that get a lot of like public direct criticism right like it, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're just a student of of some subject matter like you might you get graded right but it's not like yeah. the professor's up there saying like oh well james got a c and this is why mm -hmm. and i think it's bad <laughs> so everybody else can hear about it right like mm -hmm. that that is that is an interesting um little tidbit about the fine arts right that mm -hmm. now what what type of what type of art was it was it was it was it art or was it music or what what were you what were you uh, digital before? media oh okay it was digital, digital media okay yeah cool. so Basically, any anything how to make art with anything digital. <laughs> so, so you got that was like the perfect combo. 
yeah. you were doing digital media <laughs> to do board games and you were learning how to mm-hmm. take intense criticism from random people so those two things that's great mm-hmm. that's cool so one thing that you you have been um super successful with your mm-hmm. first few designs you have three three games that have been signed i think am i right about that mm-hmm. so you have yep. book of villainy which is on kickstarter right now and yep. then you have Wicked and Wise, which is mm-hmm. coming to Kickstarter. Um, and yep. then your third game is Mansplaining. And is that mm-hmm. is that signed and going to be published, or is that going to go through Kickstarter as mm-hmm. well? That's signed and is going to be published. Okay, great. So, so mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about those other two titles, because like, um, you know, I, yeah. I'm always interested with designers. Um, yeah, like you look at one game and you think, oh, well, yeah. the next game, they're just going to make a sequel to the first game. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. They, they have many different <laughs> ideas in their head at once. Right. So. So. Yeah. Uh, so what type of games are, are the two other titles? So Wicked and Wise is an asymmetrical trick taking uh, team game. So <laughs> you're on a team of dragon and mouse and um, you're working together to try and get the most coins because dragons love treasure. Um, and. I have it so that the dragon is always going to be the one that's doing the trick taking, but the mouse role is more of a support role. So people that don't necessarily like trick taking um, really like taking on the support role where um, they have to instead be in charge of both the money as well as card manipulation. So like you start out, the dragon starts out with say the weak cards in the deck. Um, the mouse has the job of getting the stronger cards, which only they have access to and feeding it to their partner in order to win the tricks. Cool. So I, I am, I am a very, I'm a fan of trick-taking games. So mm. I, I played a lot of hearts as a young person, which I enjoyed yeah. a lot. Um, it, it's not team based, right. But, yeah. but, but I, I, I love the idea that you can get into a round of hearts and like be doing very different things. One person's mm-hmm. like trying to win every trick. One person's just trying to dodge cards the whole time. Yeah. And then I, I got recently, I got very into the crew, which, mm-hmm. which I think is just a fantastic game. If, if people are watching, have not played the crew. Um, yeah. Play it. Uh, but, but I like the idea of, I mean, so, so essentially like, did that, did that get born out of like spades or something? Uh, <laughs> as a game? Exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah. I had started a designer diary with that too. Cause I was just like, how can I make a co-op game that I actually like to play? And I was like, spades to me feels like what cooperation should be, where yeah. you don't know what they have in their hand, but you have to depend on them yep. to get the job done. So yeah, that's cool. And and that one is um, being published by Weird Giraffe Games. Uh, yep. It's being uh, the art is being done by Beth Sobel. Um, yes. For folks who watch the stream, uh, you've seen Beth Sobel stuff. She's a great artist. Has a lot of really cool uh, games under her belt. Um, and and like her art style for uh uh physical stuff animals Mm -hmm. and and plants and stuff is just so good so i've seen some shots Mm -hmm. of some of some of the cards that are going to be in this game and it's just going to be like really beautiful so um i'm excited to see that one um all right so let's talk mansplaining what's what's the what's the mechanics of mansplaining (laughs) so mansplaining is a party game And basically, you have 60 seconds to explain how to do something while inserting uh, four random words. So, for example, you have to explain how to tie your shoe, Um, but you draw four cards and those say astronaut, aardvark, pineapple, and charcuterie. You then have 60 seconds to explain how to tie your shoe while slipping in those words without... Uh, your audience realizing what those four random words are. Ah, um, okay. So you want your audience to guess what your topic is. You don't want them to guess what those four BS words are. Oh, interesting. Okay, so so they don't know the topic either. So they, nope, okay, they got don't. it. Okay, very mm-hmm. cool. So, so you have to think quick. Mm-hmm. And then you have 60 seconds of talking. Or do you get yep. a little bit of time to think? Like, do you get any time to think or do you just got to go? Yeah, you get time to think. Okay, yep. okay, cool. You get some time to think and then we're ready. You flip the you flip the timer and then you just go. Very cool. So what's what's the story with um with timeline on that? Is that that's going to be published? Do you know when uh, when that'll be hitting <laughs> availability? Um, I'm not sure. I know it's going to be within the next twelve months. Um, it's signed with Breaking Games, and I know she'd expect it in stores. But as far as the actual um, shelf date, we don't have one yet. Okay. Um, but she'll be seeing us uh, ramp up with that, and that's actually my first co-design with Mondo Davis. Oh, cool. All right. How was that process? Mm-hmm. How was working with somebody else in in the design world? Was that comfortable or uncomfortable, or how did it go? Yeah. It was super comfortable. Um, we did the entire, we designed the entire thing during the pandemic through email. Um, <laughs> and 
And that one really came together because we, uh, I'd say we designed it over email in about two weeks. And then we were play testing it for about two months before we felt it was kind of ready to start pitching. And then by the fourth month, we got it signed. That's great. Congratulations. I mean, that, um, it seems like the devil's in the details a little bit on a game like that, right? Because like the mm -hmm. word, the words on all the other cards is a tricky bit. Because yeah. there's always the tough part about games like that is like if you draw mm -hmm. a word that's really a killer, yeah. And then you're like, ah, I mean, like, <laughs> how was I supposed to do this? I guess that's part of the fun, right? Is that yeah. is every once in a while somebody just gets one that you're just like, oh man, that's impossible. Um, yeah, but, but you'll um, be it, you'll be surprised how you can you can throw in another fancy word. Like if I say, you know, I, I went to the zoo and I tried to um, you know figure out how to do this thing with my hands where you know i'm sweating and i'm exercising but like i also needed to watch out for the lions and the tigers so you know you off you have to you know keep, watch out for that you're just like is lions the word or is tigers the word yeah you know? oh yeah that's right you can definitely try to smoke screen people right yeah while you're going through it. that's cool <laughs> no that 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 sounds like a that sounds great i'll definitely keep mm -hmm. an eye out for it um what's what's the player count it's a party game so is it just unlimited two and up cool yep that's cool <laughs> So, so that's wonderful. Congratulations. You've had, you've you. had uh, a really productive couple years here. That's, that's really great. So um, what other, um, what other stuff are you working on? What kind of secret, what kind of secret projects? <laughs> what secret projects does Fortessa have currently under wraps? Let's break, let's have some breaking news. What well, can you tell me about, um, about what else you got going on? If you're, if you're able to, don't feel pressure though. Uh oh, <laughs> I'll just say, so I am now a, a game producer at Funko Games, and um, I can't talk about my games until they actually hit the market, but that will be relatively soon, like within the next six months, um, at least half of them. But I will say I, I've been working there for about nine months, and I have now worked on seven to eight games, seven which will go to shelf. So awesome. it's going to be quite a few um and i've had a good spread of games um so i've worked on kids games which was a totally new thing for me um and yeah it, it it's it's really cool that's great cause, <laughs> that's cause, as much as i got i know i was hoping i was hoping i was hoping you let something slip um but but i must say funko um is the, is the ha, has the name officially changed from prospero hall like are they no longer publishing mm -hmm. under that title okay so so yeah Funko games, I, I have a bunch of games and people who have watched our stream before, we've played a bunch of them on stream. Uh, they've been doing just incredibly cool stuff with lots of licensed content. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's been wide releases too, which is cool. You know, you'll see, I, I know they have Goonies. I think they're doing the Goonies game, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Goonies is coming up. They did Back to the Future. They did Jaws. They did the Horrified game, which is the Monsters, Monsters uh, Paramount Monsters Universe or Universal Monsters um and mm -hmm. all those games are all awesome and i think that i think that the combination the thing that i'm excited about with the stuff that they've been producing is it's they're not games that come with like a 30 page rule book they're games mm -hmm. that come with like an 8 to 10 page rule book but are interesting right so i have i i feel like they're in this awesome position and i guess i should say you're in this awesome position cuz you're part of the team <laughs> where where you're replacing so when when i was a kid i'm 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 going to whisper it. I'm 39 years old. Um, when I was a kid, um, the games were all, you know, kind of crummy. It was like game of life, you know, whatever. Um, and, but, but they have this opportunity because they're releasing so many games like into targets nationwide where we're going to have like a generation of people growing up in the United States who they played horrified as a kid, or they played back to the future or jaws or whatever. And it's like, those games are so much more mechanically interesting and like strategically interesting than the games that I played when I was a kid. And that's exciting to me. It's not just game stores anymore. It's like you can get these really accessible, tied to very popular IP games at cheap prices in Target. And like, I, I don't know, that that to me is is like real progress. And, and I'm excited by that. Me too. So, so every time one comes out, I'm going to like DM you on Twitter and I'm going to say, was this, <laughs> was this one of the seven? <laughs> no, that's very cool. Yes. Um, I'm excited for the Goonies game. I can't wait to see what that's all about. Um, and I've played it and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Okay, good. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just, every time one of those comes out, it's like, I'm just on my way to Target uh, to pick up a pre-order. <laughs> 
um so yeah a couple comments love jaws and horrified yeah those two games i love them like i remember when horrified dropped Twitter like got really crazy about it. Like everyone's posting pictures. Mm-hmm. Like I got it. It's at my local Target. And I I looked at I looked at it, I was like, what the hell is this? It's a monster movie game. And then I started like I watched some playthroughs of it or whatever. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, this is a really clever co-op, you know, kind of uh, different pandemic kind of feel where you're moving around and managing a lot of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Like I'm going to get it. I'm just going to get it and we're going to play it. And then like I instantly fell in love with it. And now it's like a a real regular recommendation for mm-hmm. you know kind of like people who don't know a lot about modern board games like yeah. horrified's a great one get it play it with your family it's awesome um mm-hmm. and then jaws is a little bit more complicated because it has the two phases and it's asymmetrical or whatever but um mm-hmm. but still really good as well a question mm-hmm. for you for tessa it says do you have yeah. a favorite type of game to work on and then a sub question is do you have a favorite age group of game of player to work on <laughs> let's see hmm favorite type of game that's kind of interesting because all of the all of the games have been different but maybe trick taking i would say i I enjoy card games um in general because i don't know the more components that get added in there the more i can just make things explode in my head so (laughs) i like to kind of get to the the slick um or the elegance of just cards and and see if we can go from there. Um, As far as my favorite age range, honestly, 10 and up, because it's really hard. It's really hard to design for say (laughs) three-year-olds or. (laughs) Yeah, that, that, that low, that low would be tough. I feel like, yeah. But it's a challenge I've had. So, um, you know, three-year-olds and five-year-olds and, you know, there's so many developmental milestones you have to keep in mind um, because you may have a really nice game, but you're just like, but they can't do it. (laughs) So, And anywhere um, where you're right on that reading line is so mm -hmm. tricky, right? Because you're going to have some five-year-olds that can read a bunch of Mm -hmm. words and some that can't. And it's like, you can't say five plus if there's reading because the kids are just like, I don't know what this says. And then that sort of kills the game. Yep. Yep. And there are just certain things that they don't do that well. Like you have to realize there was a certain age where you learned how to throw dice and let, like chuck them across the room. So, you know. And lie. Uh... You know, like lying. Like, you <laughs> exactly. Know, there are lots of games. Being able to look at your cards. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are tons of games where you're bluffing or, you know, not giving away what's happening. And I go through this with mm-hmm. my son a lot, too, where it's like he'll whisper. I've, I've got all these cards. Look at these cards. And it's like, no, 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 no. I know, I know that we're friends, you and me, you know, and, and, and normally we'd share when we have a good hand. Like, yep. You can't do that, man. You're going to give it away. I've definitely seen that in play tests. And I was like, oh, that, that won't work. Yep. yep. Yeah. No, that, that's cool. I think, um, I, I think that's a prime age group, right? You get up to 10, Mm-hmm. You, you have you have kids who can be devious. You have a lot of mm-hmm. different strategical. Is that a word? Strategic decision making. I don't think strategic. We'll say it was. I don't think strategic. It is today. Word. Okay, sure. I, I just you, checked my dictionary and it yeah. says it's there. But like the ability to think in like a lot of different paths. Like I, the thing that I'm mm-hmm. very excited about. I I my, I talk about my kids all the time. But I, I have a eight year old mm-hmm. and a six year old, and I started to play some games with my eight year old daughter, and she tries different stuff and like sometimes it doesn't work and and afterwards we usually have like a little chat like okay you know what happened did it did it go well or not but like Mm. they'll try all sorts of crazy stuff like oh i just i tried to max out in this one direction and i and i was like well that doesn't make any sense but (laughs) but hey it's cool that you tried it right so like you can make i feel like you'd have an opportunity to make games that really Mm -hmm. allowed for that kind of freedom of thinking uh in that age range Mm -hmm. which is neat that's very cool yeah yeah, and go ahead to to answer that earlier question i would say even more than trick taking i just like designing mass market games in general um so keeping an audience in mind that doesn't typically play games um is a challenge but it's also one that i'm um, pretty passionate about because i want to bring games to more people so i like that yeah i think i i am you know, I I, uh, I kind of had a renaissance in the hobby in terms of my interest in it. I, I played a lot of board mm-hmm. games. My family played a lot of board games as a kid. And then I just, like, stopped playing board games for a long, long time. And then mm-hmm. similar to you, I just, like, 
rediscovered them at, 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 at later in life. I was like, holy moly, yeah. there's all these games, right? And the thing that has been most exciting to me is the difference in like the last decade of mm-hmm. what it was like when I was buying games and stuff then and how complicated they were and how like yeah. if I wanted to have people come over, it was like, please read the rules in advance. Like, please, <laughs> please. Like, I'll, I'll print you out cheat sheets you know to have and and hold whatever and like you just had to trust that your players were going to be very patient with you if they weren't yeah regular players but i feel like now like there are so many good games getting designed and released that are way easier and more accessible and like Mm -hmm. present all the same kind of similar you know crunchiness uh and strategic strategic value and all that sort of stuff so yeah i i think that's exciting i'm 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 always interested to hear designers who want to be in that zone like i think that's a cool yeah. a very cool place to be and and at funko games is it seems like the right place to be if uh, if that's the type yeah. of games you want to make so that's really cool um mm-hmm. is is funko your first um official job in the industry is that is that kind of the first thing you did that's congratulations yep. that's really cool thank you yeah. <laughs> thank you so yeah, um, that, um so a random thing i always like to ask people is mm-hmm. physical and digital prototyping so you have a background in in actual creating stuff, right? Not not every designer does. Yeah. Um, but yeah. were you were you creating physical prototypes for most of this? Was it important for you to get people feeling the stuff, or would it mm-hmm. be enough to sort of like do it in do it in a digital system? And or do you think there's better value in actually taking the effort and creating that physical piece to sort of ha- see how people mm-hmm. interact with the with the physical space? Yeah. Um, pre, pre pandemic, um, I definitely was doing all physical play testing because I didn't have any online group to even, um, do digital play testing with. Um, it wasn't until pandemic that somebody taught me how to use tabletop simulator. And, um, I was able to get that going and, and join these different communities that were popping up. Um, but now as far as the process, it's a, it's kind of a fusion of both. Um, I like the, the quickness of being able to iterate digitally um, and also play test it, like get some quick, um, you know, changes. Like maybe there is something that was misspelled or maybe I just want to tweak one number. Um, Like having to spend money and print that off and then spend the hour to cutting every single thing out um, and making sure everything is right. And then having to set up time to actually play test with somebody in person that would have taken so much more time, like let's say a week um, versus, you know, make the change in five minutes, upload it and then test it the same day. Um, So as far as my iteration process digitally, um, I like to get all the small things out of the way. And then once I've made a huge kind of milestone where, you know, I think this is how it's going to stay or um, I found the core of the gameplay, that's whenever I start um, doing a physical prototype um, to kind of see that the the components are playing how I want it um, to make sure that the rules are written down and not just in my head and, and people can understand them. Um, and, and I start that streamlining process. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, post pandemic, I, I think I don't think digital prototyping is going away. I think I think a lot of yeah. people a lot of people were forced to to just kind of get used to that process. And, and maybe at mm-hmm. first it was uncomfortable, but I, I think everybody kind of realized, oh, there's a lot of value in being able to do this very mm-hmm. quickly. And with other like-minded people who you might not have mm-hmm. living around you, or there might not be events to go to, to, to quickly do that sort of stuff where, you know, you'd have to wait until the next convention or you'd have to wait till the next yeah. meet up or whatever. So yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah. So you, um, this is the first Kickstarter you've ever been a part of, right? So what was your mm-hmm. distraction What was your distraction method to not be refreshing that page constantly, (laughs) especially in in the early days? You know, like how how did you keep yourself from kind of overly just sort of like focusing on it? So my body greatly helped with that because I got very sick the exact day that my Kickstarter launched. Um, So I just... I, I, I would check more so the messages that people were seeing of like support. Um, then I was checking the Kickstarter page. And then um, after that, I kind of limited it to 
limited it um, around my work hours because like during the day I was just concentrating on work and then like lunch break or after then I'd be like, okay, where's it at now? Um, but once it actually funded, that's when I was just like, I'm good with once a day. All right. I am I am happy. I've made the goal. This is this is going to be a thing. It, it, my dream's going to like this is my my passion project. So, you know, it's finally going to exist. So I'm good. So no, now that, I just check it once a day. That is some discipline. <laughs> I, I'm, imp- I'm, imp- I'm impressed. <laughs> Uh, ha- having gone through the Kickstarter thing once, uh, I had absolutely no discipline. Um, but I, I was, I was at home uh, the whole time, you know, with my kids. So it was, yeah, it was a lot of refreshing. Many, many, many times. Yeah. Before, so it was very unhealthy, I think. So you did it. You did it the right way. I, I recommend doing it that way if you can in the future. Um, cool. So how would? What's the best way? What's the best way for people to sort of follow you? Like, what, where are you most active mm-hmm. that if somebody wants to know what Fortess is up to, both design-wise, but also just for your takes on sort of board game stuff, where, where's the best place for them to, to follow you? Uh, Twitter is absolutely the best place to follow me. Um, I like to update that to all the random things that I'm doing or watching or any of my game updates. Um, and I'm, I keep that pretty current. Um, you can find me also on Facebook. But if you do, please let me know who you are because I get a lot of strange friendship requests. So I, <laughs> uh, I need to know who it is before I accept that. And then um, you can also find me just on Instagram. All of them are at for Tessa. So that's, it's pretty straightforward Very cool. to find me. And then BGG, um, which also I have a uh, designer page on BGG and I have a page for Book of Villainy and Wicked and Wise. So um, if you've ever played them and you want to give them a thumbs up, that's great. Um, you can also just, you know, follow updates, um, there as well. Yeah. People can subscribe to those and just sort of see those updates. Mm-hmm. So that's great. Um, so, so definitely folks who are in, who are in the chat, follow for tests at all these locations. Um, we are going to, I'm going to change gears on everybody a little bit. We're going to play a game tonight. I, we, we weren't able, we weren't able to actually play a round of, of book of villainy live, but 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 I can't let Fortessa go without playing me in something. So we're we're gonna play um, a round of Tussie Mussy in a minute, yeah. which is which is a favorite of mine um, in the wallet game category, 18, 18 card wallet game. Um, it does have a nice little connection um, to to Fortessa by way sort of like a Kevin Bacon style connection um, because Wicked and Wise uh, is going to be the arts done by Beth Sobel and the art in Tussie Mussy is also done by Beth Sobel. Um, so that, so that's a good connection. Um, so we'll give that one a go, but if there are more, any more questions before we do that, if there are more questions in chat that are related to book of villainy or just for Tessa's experience as a designer or anything else, you'd be curious about shout them out. Um, and, and we can kind of handle that stuff. Um, but, but to you for Tessa, thanks so much for coming on and talking about your game. Uh, like it, yeah, was, of it was course. very, very cool to talk to you. Um, I love getting the perspective of designers, especially people going through Kickstarter, but like you're interesting also to me because like you're you're doing it as your day job as well. There are lots of people who are on mm. Kickstarter who are kind of like trying to make trying to make the jump to not be doing yeah. whatever, whatever they're doing, you know, uh, yeah. professionally that maybe they're not finding as fulfilling or whatever. Um, but mm. you kind of have it both sides, which is neat. Um, yeah. And then and then how is that? Um, how is that? Has that been really helpful for you as a designer to be just sort of surrounded by a bunch of other? game design type people? Do you learn (laughs) from each other? Is it some sort of like hive mind? How does that work? Yeah. So um, working at Funko has been like the single most unique and amazing experience because um, it is a very much a team and collaborative environment. So all of our stuff is designed in-house. Even our like designers, a lot of them are in-house, excuse me, graphic designers um, are in-house. So like anybody can contribute to the game design. Doesn't matter what your actual official title is. Um, so, you know, we all play test everybody's games. We all can say, you know, give ideas about like, oh, we need to make a game about this. Anybody can throw something on the board and see what catches. Um, but yeah, everybody, the the way that we collaborate and we just kind of throw ideas around, it, it's definitely um, like one of the most positive and, and um, kind of creatively invigorating um, environments to be in. Um, because I had, I'd only been kind of in that atmosphere once before. Um, 
ironically tying into Tessie Mussey. So I was a, a New Voices scholarship recipient um, back in 2019, and uh, Elizabeth Hargrave was my mentor. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty good mentor. But, <laughs> but um, back at this, the New Voices Tabletop um, Network, this particular convention, it was basically, it felt like going to college for board games. Like you had all of these very established game designers just talking about game design on a very technical level. Um, and I had never been surrounded by people who just scholastically, intellectually discussed board games to that degree. And um, it just blew my mind and I love that. And now working at Funko, I can get into a conversation about, you know, the merits of a, a game mechanic with a three-year-old playing it versus a five-year-old playing it and like going through the entire, you know, if then of of theories of, you know, what that game mechanic is doing and how it could be replaced. And it's just like, um, it's super gratifying. It, it's it's great. Yeah, that's exciting. I mean, it's just, you, you can you can tell that this is something that is very personally fulfilling and exciting for you, which is which is really mm -hmm. neat to see. So um, yeah. so that's awesome. And you know, what's funny is when the first game I ever bought that was Prospero Hall, like I thought Prospero Hall was a person. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I remember I went online and I was like, oh, whoops, no, it's not a person. It's a it's a company. <laughs> um, but but I always wondered, you know, because because they're you know, they would release games as Prospero Hall. And mm -hmm. I, I read about their culture that it was, you know, kind of like this. Everything was very group dynamic design. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And I always wondered, like, oh, was that maybe a little bit intended? Like, like. Mm -hmm we we are prospero hall you know like yeah because the, the 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 logo was like handwritten it looked kind of like a signature yeah. and yeah and I, I always wanted to ask somebody so if you know if you mm -hmm. talk to somebody there you that might yeah. know i'd be curious if like there was a thought process that said mm -hmm. we you know we're the the theoretical prospero hall we all are that person yeah that we're all publishing um because yeah, it can yeah, it actually is. Oh, is it? Oh, cool. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because um, you know, normally people put their kind of the game designer's name on the box, but because of this collaborative atmosphere, it's the entire team that contributes towards that game. Um, so we are Prospero Hall, or rather now we are Funko Games. Right, right. right. Um, but yeah, that's that was done intentionally. That's cool. No, it's very cool. Um, it sounds like that's a really neat place to work. So that's mm -hmm. awesome that you landed there. Okay, so um, uh, final comment from Warp Drive, dude. Thank you. So cool that you get to develop and play games for a living. Bravo. Uh, so bravo. <laughs> um, all right. So so we're gonna change.